This is SciBite, episode 93, for May 14th, 2013. And welcome to SciBite, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly science podcast, live Tuesday evenings over at jblive.tv and fresh Wednesday mornings over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, Heather. Hey there, Heather. Hey there, Chris. Hey, Heather. Happy science to you. Happy science. What are we talking about today? Today, we're going to look at 3D printed ears, a tiny movie, a light pollution app, treating gray hair, with Enviteligo, picture books, corrections, updates, viewer feedback, curiosity news, and as always, take a peek back into history and up in the sky this week. Holy guacamole, that's a big show. We, we better get started. Let's kick it off with the news. All right, where do we start tonight, Heather? 3D printed bionic ears. Gross. <laughs> Gross. Yeah, you... You clicked on the story and saw the picture. But yes, Isaac and I 14, 3D printed ears. So scientists at the Princeton University have used off-the-shelf 3D printing tools to actually create a functioning, quote-unquote, ear that can hear radio frequencies. Well, we, right now, you know, far beyond the normal human capabilities of hearing. But they printed off an ear-shaped device. What they're able to do is incorporate the metal, you know, for the bionics part into the printing process so we they've talked about kind of printing 2d electronics on sheets you know to sort of integrate into tissue or lay on top of tissue Mm -hmm. but this is really the first time that it's been worked all together 3d printing all of this all at the same time right so they've talked about you know various creating organs and, you know, like they want to try to move that te- technology forward with that. But this would be like the first, first fully functioning organ, not just replacing, I mean, human ability. It could actually extend it. Well, that was going to be my question is, is like, does it give the person better hearing? Well, it right now it's set to radio frequencies, but oh. you could, you know, they're looking to change it to the audio type. Okay. Wow. So it's, I mean, ear construction in of itself is one of the most difficult problems for plastic reconstructive surgery because ears are really, really weird shapes and curves and you can't look at your ear with a window, with a mirror or with your eyes, but you can try with the mirrors, plural, or look at somebody else's ears and don't make them feel weird. Mm. But ears are funny shaped. So they are weird looking things, aren't they? So it's really hard to do reconstructive surgery for them or create them. Hmm. So we're looking at 3D printers actually now. Do you use a matrix of um, hydrogel? It's kind of weird and icky as it sounds. Calf cells hmm. and silver nanoparticles. They're able to form the antenna. So they use the icky calf cells to sort of develop kind of cartilage. So they're kind of give it able a little cartilage skeleton, put some hydrogel around it to kind of create the the you know soft tissue skin type things, and then the you know electrodes could be put into there you know for you know wound in a circle you know to heal like the helical cochlea in the ear that could you know that senses sound connect those devices you know to you know, something in your head. I mean, they have, you know, the cochlear devices, um, cochlear implants, should I say, as Joel said, Um, you know, where they install it and you have a magnet or something attached to your head or I've seen some of them that are more like plugs so that it feeds that uh, signal directly into your brain to kind of bypass whatever... um, I hate to say deficiency or defect or something that is wrong with your ear that makes it Mm -hmm. not, you know, able to hear as other people hear. 
Right. But this is another one of those, you know, possibilities that they could fix this, you know, implant, essentially, make it look like an ear and put it on there. And then you could, you know, restore or, as you kind of indicated, and as the, the help fact that it's talking about radio frequencies, they could actually enhance human hearing. So... Right, you could, you could make somebody a walking, uh, a walking microphone. Radio? Yeah, or, yeah. Yeah, it's like, I want to go to a different radio station. Let's see, tap your ear. But, <laughs> you know, so it could be similar to a hearing aid almost. But they are looking to incorporate um, other materials such as pressure-sensitive electronic sensors, and that would be able to pick up acoustic sounds. And I, I, I think of uh, those implants you've talked about where they put the little imaging devices in the back of the eyeball. You combine, mm-hmm. you know, you combine that, those types of advancements with this type of advancement. It's pretty uh-huh. compelling. And you also think when they, can, when they can print this kind of stuff, what else are they going to be able to print in the future? And could they, print, could they print body parts that have maybe blood vessels in them or, or those types of things that need to be sort of pre-wired in? Could they do that? And you wonder where this is going to go. Because an ear, yeah. overall, I guess, is maybe a simpler thing to print. I mean, I, yeah. I hate to not anything about this is simple at all, but yeah. not nearly as probably challenging as a heart, but maybe down the road. Yeah, I mean, they're, that's kind of what they're, they're – people, of course, people are kind of being like, we would love to be able to print out a replacement organ for someone. A kidney. Here you go. Yes, that would be very handy. Right. Um, But I mean, the chat room – uh. Minato asked about the small ear, but the bones in the ear canal. Could you connect to those to kind of pass the sound through? But that is what's wrong with a lot of um, defects in those bones can actually cause hearing loss as well. So it's all kind of each person to individual, but the fact that you can have this signal and kind of bypass anything between, you know, sound and your brain to kind of help jog that that signal through is is hopefully a large step forward. Yeah. And uh, also a step towards humans plus plus, as Factor points out. <laughs> you know, maybe you never know. All right, Heather, well, any other thoughts on that one? No, I don't think so. Okay, very good then. And, of course, more information in the show notes, but uh, let's take a quick pause. As we are one to do from time to time, and remind everybody they can keep uh, the, net- the network going here and help us afford the costs as they come up by participating in our affiliate program. And it's actually really simple to do. Just go to jupiterbroadcasting.com and scroll down to the very bottom of our website. Down there, you'll find links for Amazon and eBay and Netflix and Newegg. Think Geek, which is awesome. Best Buy, Mint.com, Audible, which is amazing. And then also Code School if you want to learn by doing and get your hands in some development. Now, anytime you shop, if you click on these links before you shop, a portion of your shopping session will be contributed to Jupiter Broadcasting. If you grab one of those extensions down there, the Chrome or Firefox extensions, then the browser extension will automatically take care of it for you. You don't have to worry about clicking that link. Anyways, this is, this is just a really easy, straightforward way to keep us going. We also have donate links right here on the side hand of the page. You can always tap one of those and uh, sign up for a monthly, and then you will know you've locked in the funding to keep us going. And we appreciate everybody who helps us out by either the direct funding or by using our affiliates because it's a great way that sort of as our audience grows, so then our costs go up, then hopefully also the same amount of people relatively participate in that program to keep us going. And thank you to everybody who does. But Heather, with that done, I believe it's time for the News Bite. News Bite! I was new. I hired a vocal guy to come in this week. Because last week, remember, there was a little bit of a mix-up, so I got a director in here, musical director. Oh, I got okay. the band. I got a, I got a vocal oh. guy. It's big. It's big, Heather. Yeah, I see. So what are we talking about in the news bite? Alrighty. It's a small, small movie. I mean, like, small, small, small. So you're talking, like, they have made 20 minutes? No, 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 no. Wow. IBM has created a movie made of atoms. That is small. Yes. Yeah, so they have, they're using this um, scanning tunneling microscope, two tons of equipment, a negative 450 degrees Fahrenheit, two, negative 268 Celsius, and it's magnifying this surface over 100 million times. So they were able to do is, essentially this is one of the only places with this equipment that you can actually move atoms with such precision. So they're able to remotely use 
uh, this microscope to control a really, really sharp needle with a copper surface to kind of feel where the atoms are and keep it like just one nano, uh, nanometer from the surface, billionth of a meter in distance. So it could actually attract the atoms and kind of pull them along here or there. So you sit there and you make, and moving it actually makes a kind of really unique sound. So they kind of touch it and move it and they hear it, hear the sound and they're like, okay, it moved a little. So able to go through and actually get a book of world records, actually verified it. Hmm. So it's 250 frames of stop motion action. Wow. It's a boy and his Adam. And it's, you know, it's like a little stick figure person walking, walking around. It has like a little ball, like an atom bouncing and flying around. So I actually did also a, um, just a picture screen of the Star Trek. Right. The, uh, so, the, uh, the, and they have the little emblem in there. <laughs> yes. That's so cool. Yes. That's, that was awesome. So they're trying doing this. It's also kind of, they recently created the world's smallest magnetic bit. So they can see that how many atoms it takes to reliably store one bit of magnetic information. Ah. So 12 atoms gets you one bit. So a million atoms could store the amount of data on a modern computer or electronics device. That means atomic memory could one day store all the movies ever made in a device the size of a fingernail. Well, so Give yourself a thumbs up. See that fingernail? All the world movies in the world could fit on there with that, atoms, possibly. So that's the method to their madness here. That's why they're doing this is because they're experimenting with getting good control of these things, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's clever. That's and cool. in the meantime, you can do this kind of thing, get a whole bunch of, uh, you know, props, and everybody goes, ooh, and ah, for very good reasons. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very good. I like that. And uh, go check out. They have a whole uh, world's smallest movie channel on YouTube. How about yes. that? How about that? Then there's other great stuff they've done. Well, mm-hmm. I guess when you got the money to spend. All right, Heather, yeah. with that filed, that means, guys, hit the two by news. All right, Heather, so uh, I have a little personnel problem here, but what's going on in the two byte news today? All righty. Quick one here, a light pollution app. So light pollution is, you know, you're in the city, you look in the sky, you see a whole bunch of gray washed out ness at night and maybe a couple of stars. Now, if you're in the middle of nowhere, 10,000 million stars. So it's when light is shining up into the sky, it's kind of drowning out the, the amount of starlight that you can actually see. So this app is a way for astronomers to track where it is, where the light pollution is bad. So it'll show you like a little constellation picture that says, look this way. And you look that way and you can kind of tell it how many stars. Like, I see this many stars. It looks like this. So then from that, based upon the amount of stars you see, it can say, all right, you can see to this magnitude, this dim star. And so what they're trying to do then is obviously, you know, everyone's seen those pictures from space where you look down and there's a whole bunch of lights everywhere and you can kind of track, mm. oh, you know, here's the coast and here's this state and that state and those cities. So possibly what they can do is sort of connect the data that they get from these to the data they get from space and kind of make an estimation so they can say, all right, here's a map of what people can see and where they, you know, how good or how bad the light pollution is. And then from there, maybe even see if they can correlate it to those pictures from orbit and say, hey, hmm, we can see some sort of correlation. Now we can guess where, where, how it is everywhere. And, you know, they're saying, you know, it's one for, um, you know, space, obviously, but it's being developed by or sponsored by the German Federal, Federal Ministry of Research and Education. Actually, it's a Google Sky map application. So... And then they, with this, they can also collect, you know, they collect all sorts of data about Skyglow without needing all the expensive equipment by, mm. you know, community, you know, crowdsourcing the, the testing. And then they said kind of some of the testers so far have said, I accidentally learned some new stars and constellations with this. <laughs> it was crazy. Oops. That was a mistake. <laughs> yep. So they can, you know, correlate it with you know, health, 
energy waste, all sorts of different things to go along with astronomy as well. So nice. Very nice, Heather. You know what that gets? That gets you a a ding for the day. Yeah. Now, I have this problem. It's called gray hair, and it's slowly uh-huh. encroaching my head of hair. And uh, yeah. I'm hoping that today you're going to solve this problem for me once and for all so I never have to worry. Yeah, well, so people who are going gray, they develop massive oxidation stress via accumulation of hydrogen peroxide in the hair follicle. Hydrogen peroxide? Yeah, you know, where they people, you know, do the bleach blonde and they use the hydrogen peroxide on their hair. Oh. It's similar to what your hair is doing itself. It causes the hair to bleach from the inside out. Way to so go, that kind of is what gives it the the white. Okay. So now they've actually and they've kind of seen that before. But a new report actually shows that massive accumulations of hydrogen peroxide can actually be remedied with uh, some sort of proprietary treatment with a topical UVB activated compound. So they have this topical compound that they put on and it actually kind of prevents or can be that can be remedied it's with. It's like a cream? It's like a cream you put kind on your of. hair? <laughs> kind of, yes. But in addition to this, um, vitiligo, and I've definitely saying that wrong. It's the uh, skin condition where it's like a depigmentation of sections of the skin. Hmm. You know, so if you're uh, you have a dark complexion skin and then the, it's those things where it has big white splotches essentially on the skin. Mm, yes. It's, it's, it's very similar where it's that depigmentation can, the same treatment works for that as well. So they were, it, you know, they went through and they analyzed over 2,000 patients with this. They found that Certain nerval distributions involving skins and eyelashes showed that same kind of oxidative stress hmm. as gray hair. Just in a more, and it's in there in the more frequent type of it. Hmm. And that is associated with decreased antioxidant capabilities of various things. So it kind of looks like this treatment can actually be used for both. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Well, then there may be hope yet for me. Yes. We shall all hope. Right, right. Uh, All right. Well, uh, should we talk a little bit about reading picture books? Yes. Okay, so they've actually found that children hear more complex language from parents when they read a storybook with only pictures. They obviously, often, you know, parents kind of dismiss those, you know, picture storybooks that don't have words as, you know, those are just for fun or nothingness, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but actually reading those kind of storybooks, you know, quote unquote reading exposes kids to the kind of talk and language that's important for them to hear, especially as a transition to school. And this is one of those times where it's all like flashback to a previous sci-bite, last time on sci This time it's actually last time on faux show. The faux show. This last faux show, Angela was talking about storybooks. It's kind of funny. I was looking, I had already done this story. I was looking on the website for something else, and I saw that she did storybooks. <laughs> I was like, "Excellent! This is a yeah." We have we have so many kids' books, so, and so many oh, of the yeah. we have a big mix. Uh, I like yeah. the picture ones, so yeah. And this, I mean, this graduate student went through and recorded twenty five mothers while they read their toddlers, you know, wordless picture books, storybooks, and then vocabulary books with pictures, and actually. Moms in the study use more complex talk when reading just the picture storybooks because they would, you know, trying to see about the extra information that they were giving to the children relating to the events in the story and saying, hey, what do you think is going to happen? And trying to point out very different things. So they were especially interested in the language actually used, the vocabulary in the language. So it, it's kind of interesting. So it means that it's kind of very significant for, you know, parents, educators, because vocabulary books are often marketed as being, you know, the educational ones and mm. foo-foo the picture ones. They're not worth anything. Right, right. But even, you know, just the short wordless picture books provide a lot of exposure to the kind of language that you need. And looking back, I mean, I worked at a, a daycare for many years and I had two younger brothers who were a, yeah. a good distance different from me. And so I remember, you know, open up the picture books and... Okay, you read the words, or I'd be like, "Hey, look at this," and just talk about all the different things mm-hmm. in the picture. That's and, fun hey, too. What do you think is going to happen? Yeah. But if you think about it that way, it's it really makes sense. So, 
don't just foo-foo the picture books and... Enjoy it all. Yes. Enjoy everything. All right, Heather. Well, the uh, Say by 2000 has what appears to be an airline. Oh, no. Yes. Oh, it says we have well, some corrections. Both. Yeah, well, because we're going to make it better, it says. Yes. Yeah, so we- last week for the Curiosity News, I mentioned, hey, there's this haiku contest. And I think you can, you know, they'll send oh, right, it to, yeah, yeah. to Mars. And it's just at the last moment because I'd written it in the show notes, but I hadn't like put more data into it. Silly me. So I went back and no, not quite. Um, I was correcting this and uh viewer uh, from my Twitter also linked it in saying, hey, Yo. not, qu- not quite. Here's the story. Well, they just linked the, the proper story. So what it is, is the Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution spacecraft is going to be launched in November. And that's going to actually help scientists figure out what happened to the atmosphere and the water that once existed on Mars. So they're going to have, their onboard is going to pack a DVD containing names of every person who sends in this poem or haiku. And then the three most popular ones will actually be on the DVD itself. They've already had a student art competition timeline that I totally missed. Um, And that public voting ended on May 6th. Hmm. They're actually going to announce the winners on May 20th. Now you can send your name and haiku to Mars if you submit between May 1st and July 1st. Then there'll be public voting between July 15th and 29th, and then they'll announce the winner on August 8th. So they're, they are identifying or describing a haiku as a poem with three lines, where the first and three last lines must have exactly five syllables, and the second line must have exactly seven syllables. So, yeah, you, well, Zikalafi uh, in the chat room says, uh, get your name on the disc too, even if you don't have a haiku. You may have to actually submit something. Um, Probably. So it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to be good. Just submit <laughs> anything that at least follows those rules. You know, not profane. Very. Yeah, yeah. But you know, five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables. Well, as far as it's, corrections go, Heather, that wasn't too brutal. Yes. That barely even deserved the fail horn. Yeah, but that's okay. So if you feel like doing it, totally fill out the form. There's information in the show notes about how to send your haiku to Mars. And I even put in my own little lame one in there to kind of key the, key the interest and get your juices Stoke flowing. The fire. Yes. All right. Very nice. Very nice. All right, Heather. Well, guess what? What? We got some updates. We do. Mentioned back in June of last year, actually about how a pair of space telescopes were donated to NASA from the super-secret National Reconnaissance Office. Right. They were supposed to be used for spy satellites. Yeah. To carry out surveillance missions under, you know, some big NRO program. And cost overruns, delays, meant the program died in 2005. But they'd already made the mirrors. And NASA announced last year, in June, that, they'd actually, that the NRO had actually given them the two instruments. So, I mean, it's costing them a certain amount of money to keep mm. them in storage, yeah. which is, you know, not foo-foo, but it's not unmanageable. And these are eight foot wide, almost two and a half meter mirrors that are actually comparable to Hubble. Now, these instruments actually have a much wider view. So, they're, I mean, they don't really see funding available for these type of things until after the James Webb Space Telescope is coming up. But the idea is... You know, they don't have all the instruments or all the launch hardware, obviously, but all you have to do is get it together because the mirror is already made. So they asked scientists for, you know, suggestions for the use of these telescopes. More than 60 proposals, they were, you know, very serious came in. The top seven ones being, you know, a Mars orbiting space telescope, an exoplanet planet observatory, just sort of general purpose fate object explorer. Uh, a more advanced Hubble-like telescope, optical communication nodes for space would actually aid in the transmission to deep space missions, you know, to the outer planets or even, you know, the, the Voyagers or something we send past that. Uh, some geospace dynamics, looking at space weather, sun-earth systems, looking at Earth's atmosphere. So there's a lot of different ideas that are going on about how to use these. So, Obviously, the instrumenta- instrumentation for these 
long way away from launch. Mm. Now, they don't have anything. They have the primary and the secondary mirrors, which it will take a while to develop them up. But in means of funding and getting it going forward, it actually, I mean, it's a huge step forward. So it kind of gives them a, um, a real leg up to use these kind of things, especially since they're there, it's theirs. Well, it's, I think it's a, I think that whole, I, I have so many questions around that whole thing. Like why, why, yeah. I mean, why did they, why were they being built in the first place? But, um, I think, oh, for I think that, if they can hold on, so the, so I guess what I, I guess what I'm trying to g- gather is, so the idea is they're going to hold on to them for now because it's not, it's not unmanageably expensive. And then after the James Webb, they might use them and they've got lots of ideas for what they might use them for. Yeah. They have lots of ideas. The, po- the whole point is, is budget. There's always so much budget, and they have you know, yeah. the James Webb. Yeah. They have slotted. They need to get it up. They say, okay, after this, then we'll look at other projects. Right. Yeah, that's understandable. It, you, got, you guys have to take your turn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that's okay, because, you know, I'm focused on uh, that uh, reality TV show is going to take me to Mars. That's what, that's my, fa- that's my focus. Oh, my goodness. So, <laughs> we talked about this last week. Yeah. And What's the latest? In September. So... And sad as we are, and everyone in the chat room just leapt out with all sorts of people that decided they wanted to vote off the Earth Island. But by May the 7th, within two weeks, they had 78,000 people apply to be one-way trip colonists. Wow, wow. All right. So, they're, I mean, they're kind of, they're, the whole goal was to about half a million applicants, which in two weeks, 78,000 people, getting kind of close. Now there's actually an application fee as well. <laughs> it, de- it depends on like really? your home country. Uh, U.S. citizens, for instance, pay thirty eight dollars. Oh, okay. The range goes from five dollars to seventy five dollars. Uh, an entrance fee, though, really? Uh, yes. I guess they got to fund this thing somehow. Yeah, they got to get some upfront funding. So, actually, kind of. Sub- I don't know. It depends on how you look at it. Seventy eight thousand is either a lot or a little for uh, two weeks. Yeah, it's not I mean, bad, I guess, when you consider it's a one-way trip. Yeah, so I mean, it's over 120 countries actually, in, as well. So I, it's kind of surprising that within two weeks they'd say 78,000 people would be like, "I am this serious." Now, there may be some people that go, "I just want to apply just to have my name out there and just to say it." Like I applied to go to Mars. True, that's true. And if you did actually get to go, even if it was a one-way trip, you'd make history. Well, yeah. Yeah. So, well, not too surprising, I suppose. All right. Well, uh, guess what? I have a little what? flashing incoming communications. Let me get my Lieutenant O'Hurry here on. Oh, oh. Looks like we got ourselves a little feedback, don't we? We do. Nikki from uh, Tor and Stowe actually pointed out to me this week the Chris Hatfield, the first Canadian commander of the space station. What came down this week, but in the meantime, he had the first music video in space. Yeah, this was really incredible. Yeah, it was. He had a whole like music Monday with it. There's a link in the show notes where it's like an hour long, where it's you know him essentially skyping down to Earth hmm. and singing with all these kids. You know, there's music and directors, and he had all these different songs. But he did Space Oddity, so he's all ground control to Major Tom. Mm-hmm. I like it. So. He totally did that song, and they film it so he's in like different parts of the space station, and you know he's talking about you know looking down at Earth, and he's got the Earth out the window. And I, w- I would say you could go as far as say this is a this is probably a, a, an a historic music video. I mean, from a technical well, yeah. perspective, it's absolutely incredible, um, yeah. and from a location perspective, pretty darn unique. Yeah. Uh, well, so, it is the first time. Yeah. It's not too surprising that it's the first time, but it's kind of funny because you see, you know, there's clips of, you know, the guitar floating away. Right. So it's going end over end. Right. There's, you know, at one point it's going end over end and he just kind of flies down the hallway, catches it, and then kind of shoots off down a different tunnel. So it's like going straight up and it's like, woo. It's, it's just really funny and fun. He's a pretty intense guy, and uh, so I didn't realize, so they had, uh, so while he's doing this, he's got a Skype connection open to somebody, and they're kind of saying, uh, all right, uh, could you uh, do that again and maybe get the camera so we get the earth in the background a little better this time? <laughs> Is that what was going <laughs> no, I on? Think, 
No, I think for that one, they had an onboard camera. I mean, it's just... It, it was when it, he was doing... There's two different events here. One, his little Music Monday, where oh, that's when okay. he went down to live video with the kids coast to coast. I see. But this was a, a separate music video that you know one of the other guys on the space station you know filmed and then they had somebody go and edit it really amazing and the, i mean the audio quality i know i think they did some mixing down on on the ground but i mean overall yeah. it's just oh gosh very it's cool really thank cool. you nikki for sending that in that's uh, definitely that's really cool and you know kind of historic i think heather that's what yes. i say all right well why don't we uh, while we're up in space head over and do a curiosity update what do you say Let's go. And lift off of the Atlas V with Curiosity. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. Wheel. Wheel. It is a wheel, right? Yeah, now. that is a wheel. All right, what, what is this? So are, we're back and we're talking now with the rover? Yes, we are back. We just left conjunction. That's where the sun was directly between us and Mars. So didn't really want to send communications when it could be all garbled. But... In the meantime, while they're downtime with rest and spring breaking, they created some new software mm. that they tested with the uh, with the rover's twin here on Earth mm -hmm. in the little test bed that they have mm -hmm. that would allow more autonomous navigation. So kind of, as of right now, it's they kind of have a 3D glasses here on Earth and say, okay, tell it to go forward this many inches, turn this many degrees, go forward that many inches. And it's very deliberate, inch by inch kind of driving. So this more autonomous software will allow them to say, go from here to here, make wider steps. And the rover itself will be able to say, I need to drive here in order to not to roll over this rock in order to not go down that hill. So it can sort of navigate in itself. And they added some, in addition, they added some safety checks to one of the, to the software, of one of the, um, the KimCam instrument, which should, never be directly pointed to the sun for a very long period of time. So they added some additional safeties in there to make sure that it, it knew where it was pointing. Uh -huh. And so it could it could turn away. It would look away if it needed to. Don't look into the sun, little camera. Nope, it's not good for us. It's not good for the little camera on, on Curiosity as well. So right before Conjunction, uh, way back when, if anybody remembers when, the Curiosity had a little computer glitch in the A-side computer. So I, they switched to B-side yes. computer navigation. And with those, the navigation cameras, they actually have A-side and B-side cameras as well. So they're going to go through and kind of calibrate the B-side cameras just to make sure that everything is exactly where it's supposed to be before they actually start driving again. Right. Oh, good. So kind of get that all calibrated and ready to go. <laughs> and they are looking at a second drilling location now. It's kind of looking at a uh, a possible... You know, it maybe get to it in a few days. It's about nine feet away where from where the first drill, seat, drill site was. So another kind of flat rock with pale veins and a bumpy surface. Nine feet, huh? Sounds like an epic journey. It is on Mars. <laughs> okay, you are driving a remote control rover. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. They're, big, they're getting bold with nine feet. I'm impressed. It, they're not going to do it like in two minutes. Right. It's going to take them a gotta, little bit of time, but that's our time. Got to take our time. Yeah, I understand. That's, that's where they're they're headed. So it's it's not too great a distance. So it's very similar to the one we had. It's sort of a a backup check. To say okay, this is this rock over here is fairly similar to what we just looked at. Hmm. Now let's go over there and see if all the data is the same. Okay, is this is the rock composition like this? You know, what does the dust hold? What does the inside the rock hold as you go down deeper into the rock? To kind of do a check to say, is it similar? If it's similar, then, you know, most of the rocks in that area would be similar and you can kind of be more reassured that what you've seen is what you've seen. Or if it's very different, you have to figure out, you know, is there some sort of instrumentation, something going on, or is there just something in the rock that, it may not it may look the same, but it's very different in composition. So it's you know a lot of things to take from there. But so they've finished upgrading everything. They're kind of they've had a little bit of test data that they're uploading now. They kind of tested the atmosphere during the break. So they're getting all their new data, they're uploading all their new software, kind of checking out the cameras, getting readjusted to everything. 
you know, doing their morning stretch, <laughs> kind of rolling around their neck and rubbing their eyes. And once things will, will kind of get going again, we're going to be rolling in more exciting news. It won't be mostly, hey, the sun's between us and Mars. Totally check in next week. I promise. <laughs> soon. Now is soon. Good, good. Things are starting to happen. Yes. All right, Heather, why don't you jump in the time machine? Speaking of things starting to happen, I've made a few improvements around here. Here we go. Nice. Yeah, you notice the smell of fries, right? Oh, my God. Biofuel. That's right. Oh, that's what you've done. Time machine's now powered by McDonald's. Only I should have gotten them to pay for that. And brought us a (laughs) fairly smooth ride to 112 years ago, May 20th, 1901. What happened this year, or this week, I should say, in science? Yes, the 3D projector, uh, Claude Grivolis, one of the main shareholders in Paris, France, patented a projector for three-dimensional stereoscopic movies wearing red-blue lenses. In 1901, I, huh? I could not believe it was so long ago. Yeah. So he used the dual camera arrangement, photographed images alternatively, created you know one master film where the left camera image alternated with the right camera image and it shuttered between red and blue. Wow. So it wasn't offset like some of them are now, but it was um, flipping back and forth. You know, you get one slide that's the red and the next one is blue. So it was not very elegant, as you might say, but uh, it was, the theory was there. Yes, it was, I mean, it was going to make it look black and white. With, yeah. When using the red blue spectacles, but yeah, it was one of those where it was like, mm. I cannot believe this happened so long ago. That was before and sound. They figured that out before they figured out sound for the movies. So that tells oh. you something. I was like, before they found sound. Well, uh, yeah, I guess Chris, you're going to make science very sad. Right, sorry, no, didn't mean to do that. I just meant uh, before, okay. you know, yeah, in in the movies, in the yeah. movies, yeah, yeah. In the, in the movies. So kind huh. of rounded out the show. We had 3D ears. Now with 3D projectors, red blue viewing, 112 years ago. Wow! And I'm gonna go see Star Trek in 3D tomorrow night. Way of the future. Wow. All right, Heather, I'll re I'll retune the Star by 2000, and then we look up into the sky. Let's go on Friday, May 17th. Look above the moon in the southwest, and you, depending on your sky, kind of light pollution like, you may be able to see a backwards question mark of stars. Huh. And that is part of the constellation Leo. That's the head and the shoulders of Leo the Lion constellation. But as far as planets go this week, look, uh, Venus, look about 20 minutes after sunset to the west to northwest. You'll be able to see Venus starting to appear. Maybe a little hard, but it's going to start coming, coming back. And we'll be able to see it the rest of the year. So it's just now starting to kind of be visible. Mm. Uh, Jupiter, if after sunset, it's going to be the first quote-unquote star to appear. It's going to be a little bit lower each day, be setting about the end of twilight, so it's not going to be up for very long. Saturn is also going to be up after nightfall. In the southeast, look to the lower left of Spica. So above and to the right is Spica the star, and Saturn is to the lower right. So the planet is a little bit closer to Earth. And it'll be at its high point around midnight. Now, coming up later in the month is kind of an exciting conjunction we'll be looking forward to. Venus, Jupiter, and Mercury. But you'll be able to see Venus and Jupiter most prominently. They're going to be closer and closer until the 28th, when Venus and Jupiter will only be one degree apart, which is about the width of your pinky finger at arm's length. Oh. Go ahead. Hold your arm out. I am. (laughs) They are going to be that close together. Okay. Okay, if you're driving, be very careful. Well, yeah. Don't, you can just hold your pinky up while you're driving. Yeah. To get it, you know. But, yeah, they're going to be really close. So st- towards the end of the month, and I'll definitely come back up again. I just wanted to give everybody kind of a heads up of really cool stuff coming up later this month. Oh, that's exciting. All right, Heather, I believe that brings us to the end of this week's show, doesn't it? I think so. Where should people tweet you if they want to get a link to you? They should do JB underscore Mars underscore base. There you go. Of course, you can also email the show, SciBite at JupiterBroadcasting.com or hit the contact link over at the top of the Jupiter Broadcasting website. Don't forget to join us live over at JBLive.tv at Tuesdays at 7.30 p.m. Pacific. Thanks to our chat room who've joined us on this uh, Tuesday night. That's also, uh, I think, 10.30 p.m. Eastern? 11? Not sure. Can't do it. It's time math, Heather. Heather, thank you for the great show. 
Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning into this week's episode of SciBite. We'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>